Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Happy Pride. This is the June Coalition on Homelessness uh, general membership meeting, and we are thrilled you're here with us. We have a lot of information to share. We've got amazing guests and um, valued um, coalition family folk here with us today. Um, if you need closed captioning, you should be able to um, go ahead and enable that at the bottom of your screen. This will be recorded, as hopefully you just heard. Uh, it'll be up on YouTube, quite possibly by the end of the day. And then Tim, as usual, will do his amazing blog, recapping everything with any of the resources in the slides so folks can go back and revisit it, share with colleagues, share with friends. Um, so I'm loving everybody introducing themselves in the chat. We love to see faces. We love to see names, pronouns where you're from, how you're connected to us. If you do not want to be included in the recording, you simply just stay on mute and throw things into the chat. The team is fantastic at um, tracking that and um, catching it and looking at it. If you want to participate, um, feel free to raise that Zoom hand, react with your emojis. Um, yeah, you're welcome. So um before we um dive dive in there's just a, a couple things i want to go over you can see the agenda here today um we are going to have uh you know we've 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 just brought on a, a new bunch of uh, board members for the coalition and we've renewed some and we, we introduced a lot of those folks at last month's meeting, but we have two new members that are with us today that we're going to introduce you to and have you get to know them a little bit. And then we're saying goodbye to a very long time key board member um, who's been with us for, I believe, about 10 years. Um, so we're going to um, say thanks and goodbye to them. Um, we have a lot to share because we have been busy as a community in terms of advocacy engaging in our continuum of care we've got the vet seniors and human services levy and then many of you were with us as we um were fighting against you know further criminalization of simple drug use and possession in the city of seattle so we're going to talk about that and then we have both this um city of seattle and king county library systems here to share all about the services that they provide for folks that are experiencing homelessness um, low income lack of access to tech so a lot to share there and the programs they have and how to access that and then we um we should have time for some member announcements so um glad you're here um we do have two public benefits keys training are coming up so on June 28th, we have got um, a little bit of a deeper dive into age blind, disabled, and social security. So um, this is not going to be your basic overview, eligibility, you know, um, kind of the 101. This is a little bit of a deeper dive. So you are welcome to join if that is information you want, but we were, we're really going to be focusing on a little bit of a deeper dive of um, disability, how to write a letter of support, um, what that transition looks like and how to support folks through that transition from ABD to SSI. Um, so everyone is welcome, but just a, a, a real clear understanding. We're not going to be going over the basics like we do in our ABD HEN. Um, uh, but those are on our um, YouTube channel. Those, those are on our um, website on the blog. So if you want to review those and then join, we would love to have you. And then on uh, July 12th, we are going to be um, doing our repeat of our Medicare, Medicaid, and our spend down. Um, so still with uh, Hannah with Solid Grounds uh, Benefits Legal Assistance um, team. Um, and that's that one that we, we've done a couple times. So, um, and that will go over kind of a more 101 level. So, um, Rachel, would you scroll? move forward to our mission, vision, and values, and um, I might just ask if someone would be willing to read that. <gasps> Allie, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the mission is we mobilize our community to challenge systemic causes of homelessness and advocate for housing justice. Our vision is a region that acts on a shared sense of responsibility to ensure that everyone has a home and our values are equity, justice, and collective action. Thank you kindly. Appreciate you being willing to come on camera and off mute to read it. You're welcome. 
I am going to turn it over to Allison um, so we can meet some of our newer board members that we haven't had a chance to, to meet and learn about and then say goodbye to Ben. So Allison, please take it away. Yes, thank you so much. I think we're going to flip the order um, and we'll start with um, recognizing and thanking Ben Mitch for his service on the Coalition's Board of Directors. Ben, if you want to wave your hand so folks get a chance to <laughs> put a name and a face together. Um, so good morning, everyone. You know, the, the power of the coalition is uh, sometimes visible and sometimes behind the scenes. And one of the things that I always remind people about this organization is we have been in operation for 44 years. Uh, next year is our 45th anniversary, so stay tuned for more on that. For 27 years, the coalition had no paid staff members. That means that we were an all volunteer powered organization made up of folks exactly like yourselves. And along the way, we were fiscally sponsored by one of our member organizations all the way up until the coalition's board of directors, which was in existence, decided, you know what? We need full range of motion. We need full opportunity to do things, um, including things that deeply angered elected officials who held a lot of power, including things like, uh, you know, considering lawsuits against government organizations, government entities. So um, it takes a certain amount of work, as I think many of you know, to create a 501c3 organization. Um, some of it's technical, but some of it's also understanding the vision and helping us get there. And Ben Mix was the coalition's board uh, chair at the point at which we made a pretty dramatic shift for the organization. And here's a great photo of Ben with our former staff person, Hillary Coleman, with Tony, who is a terrific advocate. There's Alan Painter in the background and a person whom I don't know standing next to them. Back when we um, had lots and hundreds and hundreds of advocates wearing red scarves on the um, steps of the Capitol building in Olympia for Housing and Homelessness Advocacy Day. Um, so Ben has been part of the coalition um, for a long time in part uh, because he's held different roles in the community and he's held different roles within the coalition's board, including this transition to being an independent nonprofit organization. Um, and I think we really want to express our appreciation and thanks to you, Ben, for the steadfast way that you've seen the value of this organization as a partner to and sometimes a critic of the official policies and practices that government entities might be embracing. Um, so we want to raise our hands to you, clap, thank you. Um, I think, Rachel, I'm just going to ask you to take the image down so Ben can see a lot of other people's faces <laughs> and appreciation. Um, and we know that, that you'll continue to be a partner in your work around um, disability rights and health care access for everyone. So thank you very much, Ben. Um, we are also really delighted that we have new board members joining the coalition. Last month during our election process, folks had a chance to meet two of the newer board members, um, Sherry and Megan. And today I can definitely see we have Robin with us and I'm looking to see if Harold is with us yet, but maybe one of my colleagues will let me know. Yeah, I don't see him, but I'll keep looking. Okay. Great, so we will proceed. Um, so four new board members joining the coalition for to serve three-year terms, bringing a wealth of personal and professional experience, passion, dedication to our mission, vision, values, um, and, and, and a desire to be really good ambassadors to and from the community. And that includes Robin Kosky, who's joining us this morning. And we wanna introduce and, um, welcome Robin warmly and actually give her a little bit of time since she wasn't able to join us last month to um, say a few words, introduce herself to folks who might not have had the pleasure of meeting her yet. And I will just invite you to unmute Robin and, and uh, 
introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. It's really nice to be here. Um, I'm really excited about joining the coalition's board. Um, you know, I moved to Seattle uh, somewhere around 12 years ago, and I think the coalition was one of the first organizations I remember working with um, in my role at the time. I was working at a, at a nonprofit working on family homelessness. Um, and I think I've presented at, at a few coalition board meetings and certainly had lots of partnership opportunities. Um, I worked for a long time at the city of Seattle at the Office of Housing and um, sometimes in collaboration and sometimes um, in uh, sort of uh, covert uh, opposition <laughs> to some of the things the city might have been doing. Um, so um, don't tell anybody about that. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it's it's really great to be here. Um, I think that the coalition plays an extremely important and critical role in King County. Um, and, you know, especially you know, just recently with the, the uh, criminalization of, of drug possession in Seattle. That's really important work. Um, also, um, having worked a long time at the Seattle Office of Housing, I have obviously, um, I'm pretty, um, you know, engaged in trying to create more affordable homes for people. And with the housing levy renewal coming up, I know that the coalition will play a really important role um, in making sure that that uh, levy is is successful. It's it you know it's unique um, and really such a great funding source for housing in in Seattle that um, I look forward to digging in there. Um, I guess just otherwise, you know, um, I work at the Puget Sound Regional Council right now, doing government relations work. So I'm hoping to be helpful um, with my professional role in the, in the coalition's work. Um, and I'm the director of government relations and communications there. Um, and as I said, I've you know I've worked at the city for quite a while um, and have pretty much been engaged on housing and homelessness issues throughout my career, um, my professional career. So um, I guess that's a little bit about me. Um, Otherwise, um, in my spare time, I do a lot of sailing with my husband. Um, Alice and I have a connection to the East Coast in Maine. Um, and, um, you know, the sailboat thing sounds a little bit fancy, but there's a lot of sweat equity in our boat. My, <laughs> my husband is a marine mechanic, so he sometimes literally is fixing the boat as we're sailing around. Um, so I'm grateful to him for um, letting me come along with him on his sailing adventures. Um, and I guess yeah, I'll, I'll just close there. I'm really delighted to be here and thank you all for all of the work that you do um, on advocacy and other things that the coalition does. Um, this organization is really important to the community. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, we're really, really delighted to have you. And, um, and I think there'll be opportunities as uh, folks may or may not know the Seattle City Council unanimously passed uh, the legislation related to renewing the housing levy as Robin re referenced and uh, Mayor Harrell signed it. And that means it will be on the November ballot and it is big and it is bold and we need it all. So we are going to be um, working with all of you to ensure that we pass that. But first, we're going to pass the Vets, Seniors, and Human Services Levy Renewal on the August 1st ballot. So we'll be talking about that first, and then maybe we'll have Robin come back <laughs> when we talk about the housing levy. Um, thank you so much, Robin. I think we're going to um, have to invite Harold to come on another day because I know that um, he had a, a, a pretty difficult um day earlier in the week and so i did just text him but i think i don't see him here so i will just mention harold odom again many of you may know him he has been um, active in our community for a number of years he is currently a member of the lift experience coalition he is also one of the housing stability staff members at the king county regional homelessness authority Harold has um, lived experience of homelessness and he is a really strong advocate. And we're really delighted that he is also joining the board. Oh, thank you so much, Rachel. There we go. There's Harold's bio, which is also on our website. So um, we're really delighted to have Harold 
who's been involved with the coalition for at least six years, um, joined the board as well. And I'm sure he will join on a future meeting. And those of you who haven't had the pleasure to meet him already will get a chance to meet him now. Um, or not now, but soon. So thank you very much. Um, you know, it's one of the remarkable ways that people can serve this organization to serve on the board of this or other organizations. So I really wanna just say, um, having a board of directors that understands the mission, vision and values of this coalition has been the difference between us being able to stand up and speak truth to power and us being silenced. And so far we have never been silenced and it is thanks to the people um, who helped to steer this ship and navigate us through some rocky shoals um, to borrow a little sailing metaphor, even though I know nothing about sailing. <laughs> um, so I encourage everyone to consider, you know, if you have not served on a board in your community, um, please think about lending your experience and knowledge to a nonprofit organization. And um, we are always interested in hearing from folks who want to think about serving on the coalition's board. With that, I will turn things back to my colleagues. And thank you again, Robin. Thank you, Ben, from the bottom of our hearts. Wonderful. Yeah, we, we're really lucky. We have an amazing community um, here at the coalition. So um we are moving into kind of what we're calling key community information and it sort of spans uh the the breadth and the depth of what we do in some ways so um this i'm going to turn this back to i'm not sure if it's sarah or allison but we have a lot to share on some of the work that um, we all want to get involved in around um that vet seniors and human services levy we can share a little bit more about what's going on at the city of seattle and then um really important to us as a community and talking about you know sort of the work we all do and come together is that continuum of care and there's the um annual meeting coming up so we want to share a little bit more about um why that's really important and why we encourage you to join that meeting with us so i will hand it i will hand it back to one of the two of you yeah thanks jody um, hi, everybody. Sarah Robbins, um, policy manager here at the coalition. Um, I'm going to start off. I'm going to try not to talk too much because I'm losing my voice a little bit. <laughs> um, but we're going to start off talking a little bit about um, what's been happening at the city of Seattle around um, the city's um, attempts to criminalize. Uh, drug possession and public use. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of context on how we got here from the state level. So in 2021, um, our Washington Supreme Court ruled that our drug possession laws um, in Washington were unconstitutional. And the reason that they were that they found it to be unconstitutional is because the way that the statute was written was that somebody could be found guilty of um, drug possession, which at that time um, was a felony or possession of a controlled substance, even if they didn't knowingly um, possess it. So the case that went before the Supreme Court. Um, someone was arrested um, with possession of a controlled substance that was in um, that was in their clothing that they had borrowed from someone else. So without knowing that they were possessing a controlled substance, someone was found guilty of a felony. So the Supreme Court ruled that unconstitutional. Um, and then it became the purview of our state legislature um, to decide what we were going to do um, with our um, drug possession laws. Um, this past legislative session, um, at the end of the session, um, we did not, our, our, the legislature did not come up with a new law. So things were left um, in a little bit of a, unknown area, the governor called a special session, um, which happened in May, 
Um, and as a result of that special session, um, the legislature created a, oh, and this is all referred to, the name of the Supreme Court case was called Blake. So you'll hear Blake decision, um, you know, discussed, and that comes from the name of the Supreme Court case. So the, the legislature in the special session passed um, a new law around not only um, drug possession, but also a new crime of um, public use of a controlled substance. And those two things um, became, in, as a, instead of felonies, they became gross misdemeanors. Um, there were some other, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> Um, there were some other pieces of that legislation. We won't get into all of the details of it, but the state enacted a, a new law. And with the, the way that things work in King County is King County Superior Court um, is by default, um, has jurisdiction over these new laws. Um, and so that's the King County Prosecutor's Office, uh, the King County Superior Courts, all have jurisdiction to um, <laughs> file um, criminal charges under these new laws under this, um, under the Blake, the, the Blake iteration of the law. What the city of Seattle, um, attempted to do and is still to some degree attempting to do is to um, amend the Seattle Municipal Code. So in general, the um, Seattle City Attorney only has jurisdiction to charge crimes that are contained within the Seattle Municipal Code, not necessarily what is in the um, revised code of Washington or the RCW, which is the state state laws. And the city of Seattle wanted to have jurisdiction um, via the Seattle city attorney's office to uh, be able to charge and prosecute folks under this new law for possession and public use of controlled substances. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Allison to talk about um, what that looked like, um, both in terms of advocacy, uh, what happened at the city council, and then now post city council vote, um, what we are continuing to see happen um, here in the city. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, for helping to provide the context, as I think folks uh, understand, this is this is the long game. Uh, these are issues that have been in play for a very long time in the history of this country, as well as in this city and our state. And they're issues that are going to be playing out and continuing to play out um, in the near and long term. So thank you so much, Sarah, for providing context because with a one day special session and a dramatic change in the law that many of us still don't fully understand, um, that, is, that is really you know, going to be playing out over several years, even as the legislature makes changes to that law. We understood that city attorney uh, Ann Davison and two Seattle city council members Alex Peterson and Sarah Nelson were going to be bringing something forward. What they brought forward um, was an attempt to, to, we and others think, essentially reignite the war on drugs, but do it in a way that really specifically focuses on people without homes who have substance use disorder. That's really whom would have been affected um, because those are folks whose uh, use of substances takes place outside because they have nowhere else, <laughs> you know, in public spaces. Um, so, you know, there is, there are decades worth of data to indicate that the way you respond to the public health 
crises of addiction and the crisis of people not having homes um, includes whole range of treatment options, including harm reduction, as well as housing. Arrests are an expensive and ineffective way to proceed, and they actually make it harder for people to survive addiction and get housing. So why would we do that? Well, it has to do with some of the ways in which we um, we seek to punish people before we consider them to be eligible for help. <laughs> um, and it's deeply rooted in some people's personal belief systems. And I think that was also really clear in some of the conversation at the Seattle City Council in particular. So the good thing about being a coalition is that we are not only in coalition with each other, with our member organizations, we are in coalition and in alliance and in solidarity with other groups. And it never ceases to amaze me that despite the fragmentation and isolation and loneliness that the pandemic brought us, we also made friends and we also built alliances. And among those friendships and alliances are um, new or deepened relationships with folks who were part of creating the solidarity budget, um, working on the defend, the defund, really challenging how our budget at the city and to some extent at the county works to reinforce um, criminalization and uh, over-policing or can be altered to, um, to counter those effects and to really invest more deeply in what works and in what communities need. So we were able to quickly pull together a, an emergency teach-in, a no new war on drugs teach-in, um, the link to that, which is on the coalition's YouTube channel, is in the chat. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's again, it's the power of coalition and solidarity in action. That teach-in featured tremendous speakers, both um, from the national stage and from our local region and community. And every single one of them was a powerhouse. So I warmly encourage you to watch it if you can. We had over 150 people participate in that teach-in. And it helped us to organize tremendous turnout, both in person and online at Seattle City Council. What, um, what happened was a dramatic change of heart by one council member, Andrew Lewis, on the day of, and a narrow one vote defeat of that particular proposal. Um, we are really proud to have been part of that. I think that it was a good feeling really for those of us who were able to be there in person to see City Hall once again filled with people. Um, if you were watching remotely or if you watched the replay on the Seattle channel, you might have the impression from the reaction of Council President Deborah Juarez or others um, that Sarah uh, and Rachel did, they were watching remotely, which is, boy, things must be pretty wild there in the chambers. Um, and, and that really wasn't the case. You know, this was a very well-organized and largely pretty self-disciplined group of folks who were passionate and who had really important, important things uh, that they needed the council members to hear and uh, was really powerful testimony. So um, it's, a, it's a great reminder of what it feels like to show up and do the work of democracy in person um, or remotely and to, uh, to hold our elected officials to the values that they and we espouse. Now, it is far from over. Within less than 24 hours, Councilmember Andrew Lewis um, was in conversation with the city attorney's office and others. Um, there's a lot of context here that I won't have time to go into, but let's just say, you know, this work we never thought would be over with one vote. So it's entirely likely the mayor has announced a new task force looking at fentanyl. Um, while there are some people on the task force who have um, deep and specific knowledge, there is no one on the task force who comes from uh, one of the lived experience organizations. There are no people with public health or healthcare backgrounds. There are no people with, um, housing background. So it's a little, um, uh, remains open to see what that group comes up with, but um, it is also entirely possible 
Uh, in fact, it has been stated that another version of this legislation is going to be brought forward. In the meantime, City Attorney Ann Davidson has ended the city's participation in the community court, and no doubt that will be part of the negotiations as well. We still have to do our work of showing up to speak the truth. Um, I think one of the most powerful memories that I will hold with me forever was standing next to one of our um, members, a uh, uh, person who does a uh, lot of work in outreach and um, supervision of outreach folks for the REACH program, who is one of many people who spoke about the clients whom she has lost who following um, uh, a period of incarceration came out and with lowered um, uh, resistance to the effects of drugs um, passed away of an overdose shortly after their release. Um, I see Jody has her hand up. Are you needing to say something, Jody? Please. Just doing a time check. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we have two yep. more two more things to get through. Yep. And yep. I gotcha. Thank you. We knew we were going to take the most time on this because it's the most complex and um, and the most sort of invigorating. And we want folks to be aware that there is more to come. But thank you very much, Jody, for that kind <laughs> um, grounding in reality. So um, I'm going to ask my colleagues to put other links in the chat. Looks like you've already done so. So thank you very much. Um, I want to just say that if you are a, a voter in Seattle, this is the time to um, speak up and reach out. We had, I think it's uh, 181 people take action again in a really short amount of time. And they generated almost 900 emails to the mayor, to the city attorney and to their elected representatives on the city council. Um, and that's in addition to organizing that was done by other partners and allies, Real Change, Decrim, Defend the Defund, um, and many other organizations that stepped forward, including the ACLU, Vocal Washington, Civil Survival, um, Protec 17, and SEIU 925, which represents the public defenders, all of whom were absolutely fantastic um, partners and allies and continue to be in the fight with us. Um, you know, there's more to come on this. And um, it is not without note that we used the framing of not returning us to the failed war on drugs policies and pretty much everything coming out of the mouths of the people who are seeking to enact this type of legislation is this is not the war on drugs. Well, that's a matter of opinion, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think that the, um, the, the, the thing that sticks in my mind is sometimes when, when folks start using your own framing, you know that you have um, landed uh, an important messaging hit. So um, moving on, we, we know it isn't just the city of Seattle. We know, and thank you to Nancy Kick and to others who are working on the ground in the communities where they live, including in Burien, that there are not only efforts to criminalize people experiencing homelessness, but um, but actions that frankly violate the United States law that are not going without notice. Um, uh, I think if we have time in the member announcement section, Nancy will ask you to speak up, but I will just say for those who are not aware, um, the, there is a very divided city council, sound familiar, at the city of Burien and the current mayor um, and, uh, and three other council members and the city manager um, have actually participated in open public discussions in discussing how they are going to circumvent the Martin v. Boise decision. And they have participated in a series of shockingly bad faith actions that have continued to sweep people, Burian residents experiencing homelessness from one place to another, despite the fact that um, King County and the Regional Homelessness Authority and others have made significant real offers of um, money, pallet shelters, and other kinds of supports to create better opportunities for people to live in Burien without being chased from pillar to post. Um, that 
work continues and um, we're having conversations with various players there. If you live in Burien, we need you. Um, the Veterans Seniors and Human Services Levy. Okay, please come on camera, share an emoji, raise your hand if you know <laughs> what the Veterans Seniors and Human Services Levy means in this community. It is the primary source of um, public revenue. We also now have the Best Starts for Kids Levy, but it's the primary source of revenue for support for all kinds of services that we all rely on and that are part of our network. Funding for our senior centers, funding for survivors of gender-based violence, funding for food banks and food security, funding for shelter and for housing and for services and housing. Someone who works at King County shared with me her perspective. She said, Seattle has a housing levy. King County has a housing levy too, but the word isn't in it. It's the Veterans, Seniors, and Human Services levy. And a significant portion of those funds goes to either create housing or continue the operating and services in housing that's already constructed. This is part of how we have made progress to end veteran homelessness in our community. And it's part of how work gets done outside of the city of Seattle. It is incredibly important. And I gotta tell you, it is very scary to consider the fact that we are now on June 15th and voters are going to vote on this, whether they know it or not, <laughs> on August 1st. Ballots are mailed less than a month from today on July 12th. So Coalition's Board of Directors has endorsed the renewal of the levy. I'm gonna ask my colleagues to put the link in so that your organizations can endorse the renewal of the levy. And we are gonna do what we always do, which is get the word out about the importance of this. Despite knowing that it should have been larger, we will never not fight for the levies to increase to meet the needs in our community because this renewal will not be sufficient to maintain current levels of services. That doesn't mean that we aren't going to do everything we can to pass it. We need to renew this levy and we're excited to register voters thanks to Tim and Jody and our wonderful um, voter reg volunteers who are working with many of you. Um, I think they've got 17 community uh, registration events scheduled between now and August 1st, the primary. And if you wanna know how to help with that, um, they will be glad to support you. And um, there are going to be some opportunities to learn more about the levy if you want to, including the King County Alliance for Human Services general meeting next Tuesday, June 20th at 3 p.m. And we're gonna share the link for how to um, join that meeting. And um, King County Executive Dow Constantine, who is um, going to speak in his personal time at that meeting, is going to talk about the levy and why it is so important as part of our um, funding for the network of services. There are hundreds of community-based organizations that do their work. Quick little personal note, I just moved to a new neighborhood. I just met one of my new neighbors. She works at the Southeast Seattle Senior Center and she just invited me to their Juneteenth celebration, which is happening right now, so I couldn't go. But they are one of the community senior centers that is funded through the Vet Seniors and Human Services Levy. So I'll be walking over there with some of our signs later on today. Um, and then finally, another incredibly important opportunity for each and every person on this call, no matter where you're registered to vote, no matter where you live, um, to participate in our community's continuum of care. It's such a weird phrase, continuum of care, but the continuum of care name is what our federal housing and urban development HUD agency um, came up with to describe what it looks like when an entire community, individuals, organizations, um, everybody from mutual aid providers to local government uh, who cares about ending homelessness <laughs> coming together um, means. So the continuum of care was managed through King County for many, many years. It is now managed through the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. Whatever your um, experience with the Regional Homelessness Authority has been. The COC is not the RHA, we are the COC. And the continuum of care has to convene 
um, an annual meeting, which is coming up next Friday. And we are sharing the information about how to um, sign up for that COC convening next Friday in the chat. And in order to participate, you need to sign up to be a member. Who can sign up to be a member? Anyone. If you are actively engaged in this work, you can sign up as an individual and we encourage you to do so. And of course, organizations should sign up as members as well. If you have attended a COC board meeting in the last while, you are aware that they have been extraordinarily problematic, difficult, and quite honestly, poorly managed. We have expressed quite directly to the Regional Homelessness Authority staff that we expect better going forward, that we expect better support for people with lived experience and everyone else who serves on the Continuum of Care Board. That board makes incredibly important decisions that move forward our applications for tens of millions of dollars in federal funding. Service on that board is a service to the community and it is a complicated set of responsibilities and people need information and genuine support to be prepared for and um, assisted in their service on that board. So the COC board is going to add new members and there will be some changes to the charter. We haven't seen them yet, um, but we hope to see them soon on the KCRHA website. Um, Tamara Bauman, thank you. I should have acknowledged we have at least one current member of the COC board here today. Ben Mitch, our former board member, was on the COC board but stepped off. Um, we really appreciate the service that folks provide on that board, and we need a better um, way for our whole community's involvement to um, show up and represent and uh, make crucial decisions on our collective behalf. So that's my pep talk, my pitch, but also my recognition that, um, that we need better process and we hope that a more fully um, uh, staffed board as well as a board that has more uh, members on it is going to be able to move forward in a good way. Okay, I hope that I am now only three minutes past my timeline and I'm going to stop there. I'll try to answer any questions in the chat. Um, thank you very much to my colleagues for helping out there. Lots and lots of links, lots of information and lots of opportunities to get involved. Thanks. All right, thank you. We're just gonna roll right on in to um, our library guest. So Tim, take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, Allison, for those important community updates. I think that this makes a wonderful transition into how some of that funding and how some of that advocacy results in meaningful services granted to people uh, living with housing insecurity and homelessness and other barriers. Um, libraries are wonderful resources for, for everybody, but especially for people uh, who are fairly vulnerable in, uh, in King County as well as Seattle. And because of that, uh, because we know and hopefully we'll know more soon about some of these resources. We have some speakers today from Seattle Public Libraries and King County Library System. Um, so I would like to pass it over to Nadia Brown and Dylan Baker from Seattle Public Library to talk a little bit about your program. Thank you so much, Tim, and thanks to the coalition for welcoming us to, to join the meeting today. Um, so today, Dylan and I are going to uh, share some of the key resources that are available at the library, and Dylan is also going to share an overview of our new social services team. Uh, you're going to hear both of us highlight a few things that have evolved due to or during the pandemic, and in the spirit of the coalition, we would love to start with the Seattle Public Library's mission statement. And thank you to my colleague, Dylan, who is doing the magic behind slide decks, which should receive an award for doing these at virtual meetings. So, um, so the library's mission statement is uh, the Seattle Public Library brings people, information, and ideas together to enrich lives and build community. 
So we have a mission statement. What do we do to actually support that mission? Um, so some of the key resources that the library has to support that mission, as you all know, part of this coalition, the people are everything, right? So um, if there's something that you're curious or interested in learning about, if there's something that you're trying to figure out how to do, we have a team of librarians and clerks who are here to help answer questions or to help you get to the next step. So we can help look up information. We can help you, of course, get signed up for a library card or deal with any um, issues with your library account that might be keeping you from being able to fully participate. Uh, we can also, of course, we're a library, offer reading recommend recommendations and more. Um, so examples of some of the things that um, I've either personally supported books with when I worked at the desk or that I've heard are, how do I catch a bus to this appointment? Um, how can I learn about my family's history? Um, I've read all the books by my favorite author. What kind of things would you recommend? Where's the local food bank? And like, how can I help support young people in my life with early literacy development? So these are all things and more that we can support um, you with at the Seattle Public Library and at libraries of course across the county. Um, so the, the best three ways to get in touch with us are in person, uh, Dill and I are at the Central Library downtown, but of course we have neighborhood branches all across the city. Um, for folks that prefer online, if you go to spl.org, um, there's an Ask Us uh, link that's at the top and at the bottom of each screen. And you can either chat during regular business hours or send us an email. And we also do have a good old phone number that you can reach us at 206-386-4636. So we hope through those different ways, there'll be um, something that works for you and the folks that you work with to be able to get connected with us. Um, the next key resource is of course, physical space. We have 27 locations across the city. It's public space and you don't need to spend money to be here. You don't need to spend money to just be. Uh, so libraries and in some cases, the buildings that we share with others have bathrooms, water, either fountains or refilling stations a space for people to charge devices. Um, at the, the downtown um, library, we actually have charging stations and depending on the size of the, the branch, um, other folks will have outlets available. Um, you're welcome to just like chill out, read a book or a magazine, watch a movie on a computer and uh, really most importantly, just have like a moment and some space to yourself. Um, so we also have uh, meeting rooms and study rooms that have reopened since uh, the pandemic. And those are available for non-commercial use and they're open to the public. So some of our partners um, were actually looking for spaces to have meetings and those uh, the study rooms are first come first serve and the meeting rooms can be reserved. And so if that's something that you're interested in, in doing then we can share um, that information here in the links. And so in, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna walk through the entire process of each area, but in the slide deck that we'll be sharing after the meeting, there are direct links that have the more detailed info. And of course, Dylan and I are here if you'd like to get in touch with us. When is the last time you saw a payphone? <laughs> really? So um, we don't have payphones, but the, at the Central Library, we have courtesy phones. Um, so we have two that are on the first floor on level one um, that folks are welcome to use for 10 minutes. There's a chair um, and folks can sit down and make the phone calls that they need. Um, they're local, toll-free, or two-on-one. Uh, we do ask that if someone's waiting that folks limit their call to 10 minutes, but oftentimes um, folks will be able to jump on those calls and take care of like business or get in touch with loved ones that they're trying to connect with. Um, a newer development since the pandemic is um, that we understand that folks might need to like, contact someone in case of an emergency when they're at the branches as well. And so if that is the case, when you're at the branch, you can talk to the folks at the desk and um, they'll be able to share a courtesy phone with you uh, again for 10 minutes. We're in the library, we're all, all about privacy, so we're not gonna monitor your calls. Um, so don't have to worry about that. Well, there's like a designated area that we've already kind of found for you to have a little bit of space and the phones don't, um, there's like no incoming calls. So that's one thing to be mindful of, but if, you know, you're, you're having a moment where you need to make a call and you don't have access to a cell phone, then um, definitely touch base with us and we'll, we'll do our best to help you get connected. Um, 
we also have single stall restrooms at um, some of our locations. So of course everyone, like all library patrons are welcome to use the, um, the multi-stall restrooms that match your gender uh, identity or expression. But we also recognize that some people might not feel safe or comfortable using the multi-stall uh, restrooms. And so at the Central Library, the Capitol Hill branch, and also the Ballard Library, we have changed the, the restrooms that we have to now, um, one of them is, is, at least one of them is now a single occupant restroom for any library patrons to use. So that in mind. We also, you know, we're, we're hitting the summertime. Smoke and heat is just the reality of where we are in this moment. And the library has 18 locations with air conditioning. And so if you are speaking with, with your clients and they need a place to be during the day, um, that is, again, you don't have to pay to be there, um, but you can have fresh air and cool air, um, then please let them know about the, the locations of the library that have air conditioning. And again, those links are gonna be in the, in the slide deck for you there. And so we want everybody to be present, to have access to the library and to be well in doing so. And so of course, if there are other things that, that um, you're aware of that you think would be um, changes or like things that we could do or do a better job communicating, then definitely please let me know because we want people to be able to be well and be safe and also like explore all of the things that they're interested and curious about. Um, so the, obviously this one seems obvious, a free library card. Um, so at the Seattle Public Library, most people who either live, go to work, or go to school in King County are eligible for a library card. Uh, we have applications both in person and online in Spanish, Vietnamese, uh, simplified Chinese, Somali, and in part. And uh, one of the big questions that uh, folks have for us is like, well, what happens if I don't have a driver's license? We're actually really flexible when it comes to ID, right, because um, we recognize that, you know, all of these things that are like state or um, government IDs are going to cost money. So we accept like emergency or community shelter ID. Um, and uh, there's actually like a long list on the website of, of alternate ways that people can identify themselves. Um, so we've actually had like community partners write letters um, and say like, I am working with this person. This is their full name. Can you please help them get a library card? So if there isn't something that's listed, don't think that that's gonna eliminate the possibility, please definitely check in with us. And we always encourage folks to get a library card so again, they can have full access to the library. Um, and one of the things that folks can access with that card is around computers and equipment. Uh, we know that there's a ton of paperwork and like applications and things that are involved in getting connected to the things that are essential for us to live um, and for, for us to be well. And um, so if you don't have access to the technology, then that you know, is of course an increased barrier to being able to be connected to those things that we, that we all need. And so all of our locations at the Seattle Public Library offer free access to computers that you can use to search like, online resources or connect to the internet. And at many of their branches, you can also use a library card to borrow a laptop or use one of our printers, scanners, or copiers. So um, with regards to the computers with internet, you get uh, two hours per day that you can either reserve or walk up if the computers are available with your library card, which is also one of the reasons we encourage folks to get a card. Uh, but if you don't have a card and you can't get one that day, we have guest passes. So you can get a 30 minute guest pass um, each day when you come to the library. And again, just talk to us. Again, the people are reasonable. We want you to, to be connected to like the information, the people um, that are essential for you to, to be connected to and be well. So we also have job search computers that you can use for an additional two hours per day on level seven at the central library and at some of the other branches. Um, so one of the changes since the pandemic is, you know, we used to uh, charge for printing um, and now all of the library locations offer a limited number of free printed pages. So you can print or copy 10 or three black and white pages each week or three free color pages. We also have those uh, self-service scan easy kiosks that have high speed scanning of documents and photos and text to audio scanning as well, which is kind of handy for folks. Um, and oh, the 
the kiosk can also send faxes because that's still a thing apparently. <laughs> um, so you can, of course, scanning and faxing is free. Um, we also have some really helpful tools at the library, of course, every, you know, at no charge to make it easier for people if any of your clients have vision, hearing, or mobility impairments um, in order to use the computers. We have some adaptive equipment that includes like uh, Zoom text to screen, that's like a screen enlarging software. Uh, we have like screen magnifying software, screen reading software like JAWS, and an accessibility kit with a variety of magnifiers and writing guides to use at the library. So, you know, like I've talked to folks who are like in between waiting to get their new glasses or um, things along those lines. And so uh, just check in with folks if there's something that's keeping you from being able to, to access or um, to get to what you need, let us know and we'll, we'll do our best to get you connected to something that will kind of help alleviate that. So, and those are all things that are inside of the building. We also have technology that you can take outside of the building. I don't know if y'all are familiar with the library's hotspots, um, but you can use a, a library card to check one out and to take home. Um, you can connect up to 15 laptops, tablets, or other devices to the internet for free from anywhere that has cellular coverage. And you can reserve one of the library hotspots just like you would any other item in our catalog, just like you would a book. And you can pick it up at your neighborhood branch. So um, I definitely encourage folks who, um, also like a lot of folks that are in transition or that, that are like moving into on their first place, it's helpful if they get on a hold list and you can um, you can actually pause your holds till a specific date. Um, and then, um, so that's really handy if you know that you're going into a place where you're not gonna have internet and you wanna just have like a starting point. Um, of course, we also have tons of employment resources. It's a really great part, place to you know, start your job search. And we also have resources for like, discovering a new career path, uh, gaining new job skills, creating a cover letter and a resume, and, and finding job opportunities. So there are a few QAs that I'm gonna share about ways to connect to job search and career development programs. Um, so the first is Your Next Job is actually a partnership that we have with other library systems and organizations as well. So this one, I always like to highlight because you get free one-on-one -on -one help with job and unemployment questions. And this is by phone, online, or via text messages. And in this, in this program, you get to speak with librarians who are trained to help with employment questions and career, and career questions. And again, they can help you research, like what are the jobs that are in demand and what do they pay? And they can help you search for jobs to research careers. Um, they can help make referrals to other employment specialists if there's, again, something that you know, we're not equipped to, to support, but there are other folks who can. Um, and they can also help you access like workshops and classes to help um, build job skills to increase your employability. And again, because we live in Seattle, it's important to have things available to serve the diverse linguistic communities that, um, that we're lucky to live as a part of. And so that those classes, or that program rather, is available in English, Amharic, Arabic, Chinese, Oromo, Spanish, Chagrinya, and Vietnamese. And essentially you select an appointment time and Either we'll send you a link or a phone number, and you can meet with a librarian for a half an hour to an hour. We also have job skills workshops that are kind of virtual videos uh, created with South Seattle College to help people learn some basic job skills, including like how to write a resume, um, interview skills. And with your library card, you can access tutor.com, um, which is, uh, we have a career center through tutor.com where you get free job search and resume writing experience. And they can actually help you like complete an online application or they can review your cover letter or resume um, or help you practice or prepare for an interview. We also have some free technology certification exams. Um, so if folks are looking to get uh, like certification in um, Microsoft Office and Intuit um, as like IT specs, uh, excuse me, an IT specialist, um, then we also have like those available for free. And finally, uh, which my um, part that I enjoy, the way that I use the library the most is through our in-person events and our online programs. So the library has a ton of different ways to learn, explore, and kind of find fun ways to build connections 
And those are available both online and in person. Um, so we have public programs and classes. And you know, when the pandemic first started, all of those things shifted online, but now our public programs are back in person. Uh, while some of the classes, though, like citizenship classes and English circles are still remaining virtual. Right? We have those in partnership with other organizations. But um, if you have folks that are like coming to the library, then we, we welcome and encourage folks to like come down to the Microsoft Auditorium at Central for an author talk. We oftentimes have like singing groups that come or, or like a theater that's coming to highlight some of the, um, the productions that are coming. Uh, we have like monthly movies and story times. Um, it's summer and so book bingo is happening. I don't know if you're excited, but I'm excited. Uh, and so there are just lots of ways for people to like, do things that are kind of fun and interesting and a way to be around other people who are also like doing something fun and, and like, relaxing and um, just enjoyable. So we, we'd love to invite people to those programs. Um, so if you jump online, that's like kind of the easiest way to take a look to see what's happening on the events calendar, uh, which Dylan has a link to there. And then we also have our programs and services page, which is a really good place to start because it has things kind of categorized by like, oh, are you looking for families or kids or for teens, adults over 50, arts and culture, and things along those lines. So it makes it a little bit easier to navigate. And of course, um, in the buildings, we have posters and you can also reach out to us directly and we can, uh, we oftentimes share information with our partners directly if that's more helpful for you. Um, and I'm gonna pass it on to Dylan and he's gonna talk a little bit about our social services team. Uh, thanks, Nadia. So another new addition since the pandemic is the creation of our social services team. But I also want to recognize that library workers have been, and outside of this team, still currently support unhoused patrons and folks who've experienced some type of trauma with navigating social services. So the, like this work isn't new, but um, our team is. Of course, it won't let me. I'll try again. Okay, so um, so our team is a small team. We're based out of the Central Library, um, but we also provide system-wide support. So we are comprised of three main roles, our Senior Community Resource Specialist, our Young Adult Community Resource Specialist, and my position, the Social Services Librarian. Um, our Senior Community Resource Specialist is currently vacant, but they act as the program manager. So this person will work on building partnerships, developing training for staff, and also some direct um, service support. Our Young Adult uh, Community Resource Specialist recently started and they focus on direct service, um, connecting patrons to shelter, long-term stable housing, food resources, job training, legal help, gender-based violence, resources, um, medical support. They also do some de-escalation and program coordination. And my position, I like to describe it as that I'm an adult services librarian who specializes in social services the same way that we have art or history librarians. I am a librarian who has that focus on social services. So I answer reference questions um, similar to we, but I'm also doing so at a service point, so at a reference desk. And I also keep our internal social service resources up to date. So one way to get in contact with us is through this email community resources at spl.org or to submit an email or chat. Um, and there's the ask us link that Nadia mentioned earlier. And here's a sort of photo of what that looks like. So social services and social workers in the library take, can take a few different forms um, looking at different library systems. So at SPL, we focus on direct service, supporting staff and creating partnerships. So direct service, an example of that would be helping a patron with finding like a hot meal or um, finding an emergency shelter bed also some crisis intervention. Staff support would be um, like, in, like creating tools or best practices to increase staff confidence, but also um, providing staff support with talking through complicating interactions and that training uh, component. 
And then partnerships, this is bringing in services into actual like the downtown library and other branches. So we traditionally would refer people out to different organizations, but the idea is to bring more services into branches, creating warm handoffs and just overall a better service. And as a team, our goal is to promote trauma-informed and whole person library services. And then here are some of our current partnerships. So we are working with United Way King County providing postseason tax help. We are um, one of the recipients of the King County Human Services bus ticket, um, like that program. We have Catholic Community Services once a month at four different branches, enrolling folks into Work to Lift. And a program we have our young adult drop-in, which happens um, every Friday at the Central Library in the afternoon. And so I'm also working on establishing, we had um, a phone provider in the past, so we're working on bringing that back into the, into different branches, but also establishing a coffee and conversations program, which is basically, um, which is, that's already happening at Ballard, but bringing that to the downtown library. And so that's a, a program, um, or I guess an event that'll allow staff and patrons to just sit down, have a conversation. It's a good way for patrons to get to know our team since we're a new team, but also um, for like, um, it's like a reciprocal environment. It's so it's good for relationship building, um, listening to and learning from what our unhoused patrons, unhoused patrons want to see in the library. So that is all I wanted to share. You folks have questions. Thank you and I so also, much. Dean. I just uh, really quickly, so our last slide has our contact information, but I am going to stop sharing so that I can see everyone's face. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dylan and Nadia, for sharing. In the interest of time, I would like to um, have questions posed to everybody at the end for a couple minutes, hopefully. Um, definitely we'll share, I would love to share your slides. I will definitely share your contact information. Um, thank you so much for being here and, and chatting with us. I would like to pass it over to Susie and Tony now from uh, King County Library System. Hello, let me uh, share my screen here. Okay, did that open up? Oops, went ahead. <laughs> so good morning. Um, my name is Susie gonzalez Pushner. I am the Homeless Outreach Service Specialist for the King County Library System. It is so great to see you, Nadia. <laughs> we've, we've met just, I believe, virtually. And um, thank you for such a great presentation on what's happening at Seattle Public in the library and out of the library. I am going to concentrate on the um, outreach portion of our program for the King County Library System. And Tony will be speaking about our peer in the library program. So um, why is this work important? Well, we are all well aware of the housing and security um, emergency that we're having in King County. Um, and it, this work just aligns with the King County Library System mission to inspire the people of King County to succeed through ideas, interactions, and information, our values of knowledge, diversity, equity, and inclusion service mindset, and our goal of creating communities of inclusion and belonging, responsive and inspirational services. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the King County Library System. Um, we are, 50 libraries in 38 cities. We provide um, services to 2.25 million residents. Uh, Seattle Public is not part of the King County Library System. They serve the 733,000 people of Seattle really well. And we have 1.2 million card holders. So I wanna talk about a few of the services that we are offering to our unhoused patrons. We have a, um, a book tote service, which is a once a month book tote services. 
We provide books in magazines for our patrons. These are ARCs, our advanced reader copies, and magazines which they get to keep. And um, we take these to our partner locations to share with our unhoused um, patrons. We also take them to tent cities, shelters, um, transitional housing locations, medical clinics. We serve about 50 locations in King County. We also provide themed activity kits. Each activity kit contains supplies for 20 people to um, share with the activities, share within the activity. Um, these can be do, done um, alone or they can be done um, as a group activity so the partners um, can connect with their guests and create community and form new relationships. Um, each, uh, we have six different themed kits. Uh, we have vision board kit, a fun and games kit, birds and blooms, summer fun, self-care and greeting card. And we provide these to our partner agencies also. We have hotspot devices and laptops that we, um, again, check out to our partner agency and they, they in turn check them out to their um, clients or use them within their location. With these um, laptops, we provide technology classes. Um, we help them with social services resources. Uh, we also uh, work to teach them library resources. The um, library resource classes, we go into the partner location and essentially do a class like Nadia's presentation. What can you get at the library? You know, we talk about getting a library card. We talk about free printing. We talk about um, checking out a computer for two hours at a time or using a computer in the building. We talk about classes we have available like um, the online classes and how they can uh, use those to, to learn, um, I'm sorry, our online da databases and how they can use those databases to um, learn new skills or to improve skills. We talk about the Microsoft certification classes and the Microsoft free certification tests that they can take at the library. We um, help, we have digital navigators so they can get one-on-one -on -one uh, computer and or internet help uh, and at the library we also have your next job available to them the, and in partnership with Seattle Public. We have a one-on-one -on -one financial assistance service where they um, can write in and um, ask for assistance whether it be um, financial assistance for help for rent or if maybe it's someone who wants to start a small business, they can also um, just put what their need is in the librarian will contact them and they will have that one, a half hour of one-on-one -on -one time with the librarian who will share resources with them. Uh, you know, you get a dollar fifty of free printing uh, a week, which is 10 black and white copies or three colored copies. They can check out books, DVDs, um, audio books and Again, we really love teaching them how to access the databases, the online classes, and the certifications. We also have a KCLS YouTube channel where they can take um, Hope Link's uh, credit, consumer credit classes, and that's available to them also for free. We do uh, early literacy program um, at Locations with Children's. This is our Ready, Set Kindergarten program, which we are doing um, currently at Mary's Place and Fusion House, and we'll be increasing to six other locations next year. We provide the children with um, backpacks with everything they need for our program. A lot of the materials are also things they will need to start kindergarten. It is a six week program and um, we go, I can go in, um, we do a feelings check-in, we do a story, a craft, um, and then we always end with a happy dance. It's really fun. The parents participate with us. Um, sometimes they don't and that's okay too. And uh, every child gets to keep also all the books that we bring. So they do get like a small library collection and their backpacking materials and they love it. They're so excited when they go through this program. 
we are doing a lot of resource fairs with our community partners. Um, and these resource fairs, we um, invite, there, we can do them several different ways. We can go and support a resource fair, such as Transform Burien had a, um, a D Indigenous Peoples uh, Fair last year, and uh, we were able to go and support that. It was a fantastic fair. The mobile vet was there, the mobile medical was there. Um, they had about 200 people. It was a very well visited uh, event and people were able to get all kinds of resources. We also had resource fairs in our libraries, which we invite our community partners to be part of. Um, we have, we've been holding them at libraries throughout the region. Uh, the picture here just happens to be at the Woodmont Library. We have someone who can help provide a free phone. We will have a um, multi-service center come and someone can help with coordinated housing entry. Salvation Army is usually there. We have we try to have a shower truck at those resource fairs. Um, we also have Union Gospel Mission. We have just so many partners that come and help people with the resources on those days. We generally have uh, um, at a resource fair anywhere from 40 to 70 people in a two hour period. They're very well used. I can also go to your location and do a library card fair or, um, or just a quick, um, or a quick visit with people uh, at your location to talk to them about what the library can provide. We also do Greenbelt outreach with our peers. We join Mobile Medical at uh, locations throughout King County to provide Greenbelt outreach. Um, and we do that with our peer. This picture here is our peer, Tony. And Tony, I will turn it to you now. Thank you so much, Susie. Um, I'm Tony. I'm a peer in the Renton Library. Uh, and I think having peers in libraries is amazing. Uh, we also have peers in Bellevue and Berrien and Federal Way. Um, peers, I think, can go beyond the scope of uh, most librarians by helping people um, on their journey to whatever they need to get done. Uh, we can go with people to uh, get their IDs to DSHS. Um, I can help you if you need help uh, advocating maybe to your social worker. Um, we just had a huge resource fair in, uh, in Renton on last Saturday. It was uh, Jody and Tim were there. It was great meeting them. Um, and it is, it's just great. We had uh, haircuts, it, uh, people to come in uh, from the hair school and clothes. Shower trucks weren't there. They hopefully next time uh, the the vet we were able to get the vet come in. Um, and I I love being up here in a library because you really get to connect with people. On I think that's how you find out what people's needs are is by connecting with them. And so uh, I help people. They can use our address for for different things. And so I think a. Uh, addresses are sometimes hard to find. We help people get into inpatient and detox. Um, we also help people with laundry. We'll, we will hopefully have uh, a resource soon where we can give somebody a card and then they can go to the laundry mat. Uh, that's in the process of being worked out. Um, and yeah, so I think that's about what most of uh, me and Susie do. Uh, is there any questions or uh, I'd love to answer them. Uh, thank you so much, Tony and Susie, for sharing. Um, I'm going to just I jump in here really quick. Yeah. We would love to partner with you. So let us partner with you. These are some of our partners already. And we would love more partners because getting our partners out there to provide resources to our unhoused neighbors is the most important thing that I feel we can do. So there we are. Oh, also, we just recently um, had uh, our, we've just recently hired a new social worker. She is our health and social services coordinator. Her name is Alyssa Adwell. 
She has been with us a hot minute, literally a week. So um, I am so happy to have her join our team and really look forward to um, creating amazing work with her. So thank you. And uh, Tim, please. <laughs> Ah, no, thank you. That's really good information. I'm very excited to have uh, especially your contact information and our follow-up blog so that people can reach out to you to build some, some beautiful partnerships. Um, yeah, thank you so much, um, everybody. Uh, Nadia, Dylan, Susie, and Tony for, for speaking with us today. Um, I would like to take a couple minutes if anybody has any questions for our presenters. I would like to add something real quick. Uh, I just want everybody to know that uh, they can send people down to the libraries if they do need assistance. Uh, we are there to get people's basic needs met. We can help them get into shelter, clothes, all of that stuff. So please feel uh, free to send them down to Renton, Federal Way, and Beering. Perfect. Yeah, we were running a little behind before, um, but I, I feel like we've caught up well. We had some great presentations that were lovely and succinct and informative. Um, I suppose, if, so this is still a time, I think, for people to ask our presenters questions, or if there aren't any questions, this could also be a time to do some community sharing. If anybody wants to share, um, any, any updates from their organizations? If anybody has any questions for the group, this is an okay space for that. Ah, thank you, Tim. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. Perfect.